Welcome to the Cowansville Baptist Church, the Church of Connection. And today we're going to talk about the respect that we're going to have towards the authorities. The, the, Lord, sorry. <laughs> the Lord put on my heart this subject that is of actuality right now. With this COVID-19 crisis and this uh, Law 61 project and the degradation of our religious freedom, it provokes mixed feelings and opinions towards our leaders and government. And, but I just want to uh, assure you that I, I won't be talking about politics this morning. But after seeing and hearing some stuff on the internet from the Quebecois and also from some Christians, I believe that it's a good thing that we have this discussion this morning together concerning our authorities and what we should have as attitude towards our leaders. So before we go further, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and fill my brothers and sisters with your Holy Spirit and open up our mind, our heart, and our soul, and our spirit to your word. Yeah, make your word fill ourselves and instruct us with your teachings and Lord take our hearts and transform our hearts to your will in Jesus Christ's name Amen so this morning we look at three incidents that we find in the scriptures in which believers were confronted to authorities and we'll see what attitude these believers adopted towards their leaders. First incident that we're going to look at, it's Daniel towards King Darius. We find that incident in the book of Daniel chapter 6. In this story, we won't read it because it's long, but I will just resume it to you. Daniel was prime minister in the Mede Empire, and he was first under King Darius, and he was really appreciated by the king. Daniel was also the chief of the satraps. The satraps are the governors of the different provinces of the empire. But these satraps, they were jealous of Daniel's privileged position and they sought to make him fall. Not finding any fault in Daniel's work because Daniel was a faithful man to the king, they attacked his fate instead. And the satraps then rushed to see the king and making sign a new law stipulating that none shall address prayers to any other god than the emperor. And the penalty to trans for transgressing this law will be death into the lion's den. Well, not seeing any objection to this law, Darius signed this law, which became irrevocable according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. So, in this incident, the king has absolutely nothing against Daniel. Actually, he really likes Daniel. But the king fell in the trap of the satrap's political schemes. And in one blow, because of the satrap's lobbyism, the people of the empire saw their religious freedom taken away and be replaced by, by a forced religion, forced adoration towards the government. The satrap's objectives in all that scheme was solely to trap Daniel because they knew that he will, he will continue to pray the Lord is God. And they wanted to make him die devoured by lions. Now, what was Daniel's attitude towards the, his government, towards his king? First, Daniel stayed faithful to God. He stayed faithful to the Lord acknowledging that God is the supreme authority. He disobeyed the law by continuing to worship God and pray to God. And in his prayers it says that he made supplications to God, probably because of this new law that just passed. Second, Daniel had faith in God in this whole incident. He trusted in God even if that will cost him his life the Lord was the one who could deliver him 
from this trial. And Daniel feared God's law more than he feared the government's, government's law. Sorry. Third, after being thrown into the lion's den according to the king's order because of this unjust law, Daniel still kept his respect for the king, saying, O king, live forever. You know, he could have cursed the king for this bad decision or accused him of being stupid. But instead of that, Daniel blessed the king. He was respectful towards the king. And fourth, Daniel affirmed his case before the king. O king, I was found innocent before God and before the king. I did nothing wrong. Daniel compares his behaviors to God's law and not to the state's law. According to God, Daniel did nothing wrong, but he did what was right. So, what we see next is after that, Daniel was put out of the lion's den. The king ordered that the satraps and all their family be put into the lion's den. And they were crushed to pieces by the lions even before they had time to hit the ground. The Lord brought justice to Daniel. Daniel didn't have to avenge himself from his enemies. It's God who brought justice in the end. And finally, the Lord glorified himself through the mouth and the decree of the king in the whole empire by ordering that all of the people fear the Lord, the God of Daniel. Isn't that amazing? So, what we see here is a man of God who was trapped by political schemes with the goal of making him die. It might happen today that our government may manipulate, may be manipulated, sorry, by lobbies or exterior pressures who push it to make decisions and take directions that was not part of their original plan when he came to power. But for us, we see just the chief of this political party. We just see the figurehead. We rarely are aware of all the gears of this political machine that's behind this leader. Here, Daniel was victim of bad decisions from the king because of his counselor's schemes. The king didn't have any in bad intention towards Daniel, but the law that he signed put Daniel in peril nonetheless. And despite that, Daniel stayed faithful to the Lord and he also stayed respectful toward the king. For us too, it happens that our government issues laws that go against our Christian's value. The government's intentions are not directly to do harm to us Christians, but their decisions still impact our lives. Like Daniel, it's important to stay faithful to God's prescri prescriptions in His Word while we still maintain our respect to the human authorities. So that was the first incident. Let's go to the second one now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego towards King Nebuchadnezzar. And we find that incident in the book of Daniel chapter 3. So, to commemorate his glory, King Nebuchadnezzar orders to build a grand golden statue of himself. And then he establishes a new law, stipu stipulating that at the sound of the instruments that were disposed to this effect, the people will have to bow down before the statue and adore it. And those who will not comply will be thrown into a burning fairy furnace. However, there were among the king's counselors three young Jews who were taken during the people of Jer Jerusalem's deportation to Babylon. And they were far wiser and more intelligent than all the other young men brought to the king's service. But these three young men, they refused to bow down before the king's statue knowing that it was an abomination before God. Why? Because the Lord is the one true God and He's the one who is worthy of adoration. All other kind of adoration or veneration is idolatry. And it's exactly the reason why God had chased the people away 
the people of Israel away from their land. Some men reported the three young Jews to the king, and angry and furious Nebuchadnezzar called the three young men to explain themselves and to see if this whole story was true. He orders them to once more bow down before the king's statue, and if they refuse, they will be thrown into the burning fiery furnace. And then he proudly asked them who could deliver, deliver them from his hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver, deliver us from the burning fairy furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Hearing these words, the furious king asked that the furnace be heated more than normal. The guards that threw the three young men into the furnace were killed instantly by the heat of the furnace flame. So you can imagine how hot it was. But the Lord comes in person to join the three young men in the middle of the furnace and he protects them from harm. And when the king sees that into the fire, he orders the young men to come out of the furnace and then he saw that they had absolutely no damage at all. They didn't even smell the smoke. And in this, in the, sorry, in this incident, we have a government, government whose ideas are opposed to God's prescriptions. They were even official threat from the government against those who will disobey the law. They will be cruelly executed. Hmm. The king wasn't directly opposed to the Jews, but his law by definition was. In front of this law, what was the attitude adopted by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, first, they chose to disobey the government to stick to God's law, despite that it could cost them their lives. They didn't make compromise with their faith under the pretext that they had to be submitted to the authorities. God's authority surpasses the government's authority in that matter. Second, they trusted the Lord to deliver them from the king's hand. However, they were submitted to God's decision. They didn't um, force God's hand in that matter. If the Lord would deliver them or not, they would stay faithful to God until death. So they were ready to die for the Lord. Third, despite the fact that they defied the government's law, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't lack respect to the king, saying, O oh, king, even if he was standing before them as an enemy. You know, it happens that the government adopts laws that the people, uh, laws, sorry, for the people that goes against the principles and the prescription prescriptions that we find in God's Word. When that happens, us Christians, we have a choice to make. We can make compromise with God's Word to submit ourselves to the authorities. In this case, we're displeasing the Lord, who sees it as an adultery. Why? Because it's a sin. Because it shows that we fear man more than God. Or the other choice is that we don't make any compromise with our faith. We stay faithful to the Lord and we accept to pay the social and the legal consequences that it will cost us. Third incident now. Let's see what happened with David towards King Saul. We find that incident in the first book of Samuel in chapter 24. Saul was the first king of Israel after the Israelite asked the Lord for a human king to rule over them because before then, until then, God was the one who directly was ruling over the people. 
And God gave them Saul, a good-looking man who was taller than everyone by, by at least one head. But you see, Saul feared man more than God, and he did what's wrong to God's eyes, who rejected him as Messiah. And God chose a young shepherd named David in his place. And he gave him success at war, and he was admired by the people. But you know what? In fact, Saul was still the king, and he got jealous of David's success. And what's more, Saul was from time to time tormented by evil spirit who made him angry, made him aggressive. And David had to flee and hide from Saul because Saul wanted to kill him. And in this incident, in this chapter, King Saul learns that David is hiding in the desert. He takes it down. Saul takes his army and go in search of David and his men to kill them. The king's intentions here are clearly evil. He voluntarily wants to arm David. His actions and his decisions are straightly directed toward David. So, arrived at the desert, you know, Saul can't wait and he has to go to the bathroom. And he finds a dark cave that will shelter him from the sight of his men so he can do what he has to do. But what the King Saul doesn't know is that David and his men are hiding in the back of the cave. And with their hands on their nose, they look at Saul who's vulnerable and is at their mercy. And it's then uh, one of David's men says to David, Here's your chance to get rid of him once and for all and finally discard any danger from you. If you do that, you'll be able to take the throne in his place. It's certain that this opportunity comes from God. He's the one who puts Saul's life into your hand. So what are you waiting for? Go! So David stealthily approached Saul from behind and he cuts the edge of his coat. And at that moment, he feels his heart pound as he was doing something wrong. So he stops and he decides to let Saul go out of the cave without arming him. And after the king went a certain distance, David comes out of the cave and he shouts at, the, at Saul. He says, My lord the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointing. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and I did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you, May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, Out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. In all these words, David reveals his heart's feeling for the government, for the authority who clearly stands as an enemy against him. What do we see? Well, first, David starts by demonstrating a deep respect to the king by calling him his lord, his father, and bowing with his face to the ground and paying his homage to the king. He shows in this way that he speaks to the one in authority over him. 
Second, despite that Saul considered David his enemy and that he voluntarily sought to arm him, David didn't raise his hand against him, acknowledging the role that the Lord gave to Saul as Messiah. Maybe he didn't like the man, but he respected Saul's position of authority. Third, despite Saul's foolishness, David didn't have any wrong or treason in his heart against the king. Fourth, David left justice and revenge into God's hands for Saul's wickedness, but David's hand will not be against King Saul. Here we have an evil government who takes hostile, voluntary, and directed action against David, a man with a heart according to God. And once more, David, the believer, maintains the sincere respect for the authority without insults, without calumny, without gossips or blasphemy. He's confident that God will bring justice. It's the Lord who will avenge him from Saul's wickedness. It's this thought that allowed David to stay respectful to Saul in his heart. So for us too, it can happen that one day the government will have hostile and directed intentions towards Christians. And despite that, it's not up to us to bring justice to ourselves. We can't defend our cause by claiming our innocence, but vengeance doesn't belong to us. The one to whom we have to turn for justice is God Himself. He's the just judge, and He's the one who will avenge us from our enemies. For us, our attitude should be to do good all the time, to respect our government, even if it's evil, and to bless our enemies, just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, when he says, But I say to you, love one, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. And as a conclusion, I would like to read the first two verses of Romans chapter 13, which says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Here, Paul reminds us that all authorities have been established by God, regardless of if this authority is good or evil. And it's because of that, because it has been established by God, that we as Christians must be submitted to it and respect this authority as we are submitted to God's rule. Note that Paul wrote these words in a time when the Roman governor, government and the Jewish authorities, they were persecu persecuting the Church of Jesus Christ. So Paul knew exactly what he was talking about because he himself experienced a lot of injustice and persecution from the human authorities without lacking any respect from them, for them, sorry, and without talking against them. So for us too, in our times, we're confronted to directions and decisions that are taken by our governments which, won't, uh, which we don't always agree with. Some of these decisions don't affect our faith much, but others go against biblical principles. And since the world is secularizing itself, which is just another way of saying that it's turning away from God, the situation won't get better, you can bet on it. On the contrary, this is the world and the reality we are living in. However, the attitude that the Lord is telling us to have towards the authorities, that doesn't change. It stays the same. The Lord tells us to be submitted to the authorities as long as they don't ask us to go against the principles and the truths of God's Word. In this case, if that happens, better obey the Lord than obey the authorities since God is the supreme authority. The Lord also tells us to be respectful towards our government. It means to watch our tongue and to be careful of what we say about them. 
God calls us to treat them with respect because He is the one who established them in their position. And finally, the Lord tells us to bless and not to curse those who stand against us to arm us. This message this morning speaks to me personally because it's so easy to speak ill and despise the leader, our leaders when we see the directions and the decisions that our government too often makes. I have the right to disagree, but the Lord doesn't give me the right to be disrespectful towards our authorities and towards our government. So let's be true citizens of the kingdom of heaven by acting as such in this world who's becoming more and more hostile to God and to the rule of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this message, this is something that we don't talk too often in churches, but it's part of the prescriptions that we find in your word. So they are as important as the rest of all of what is written in your word. And we want to apply that in our lives too. We want to re be respectful to the authorities. We want to submit ourselves to the authorities because you are, are asking us to be submitted as we are submitted to your rule, to your will, Lord Jesus. So give us the strength, give us your love, give us your wisdom to do exactly that, to be submitted and respectful as long as the governments and the authorities don't ask us to disobey your law. If that happens, give us the strength to stay in the truth and to stick to your prescriptions, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name, Amen. Thank you.